This session will be about uh, visualizing temporal data, uh, what you can do today uh, in uh, 4.10, what you will be able to do tomorrow in uh, 4.11, I mean, not tomorrow, but like when it release, and, uh, and then the plans that we have for uh, uh, adding more time support in uh, the API. So I'm joined with Jeremy Bartley, uh, and yeah, and uh, Richie, and, uh, and, and me, Jan. Uh, all the slides uh, are available on GitHub. If you, uh, uh, I can give you like 10 seconds to take the picture of this URL. Otherwise, it's gonna be also in the proceedings. Uh, all the code for the demos uh, will be also available, uh, is also available on the repo. All right, let's get started. So uh, we're gonna go over the time support in the JavaScript API, the new APIs in 4.11. Uh, coming soon, uh, we will uh, do, uh, we'll go over yeah, those APIs through demos, uh, and then I will show how to use Arcade to visualize your data using uh, edge rendering, and then we'll go over visualizing time using a technique uh, use, um, that, that uses the visual variables of the renderers. Um, so in 4.11, uh, we are shipping new, uh, uh, new APIs. First, uh, the time metadata that will come through the feature layer. So the feature layers that will have this uh, uh, time info uh, uh, metadata. So it will describe what are the time fields of uh, the, the time related fields of uh, each uh, feature. And then we are adding uh, the 3x uh, time extent, as some of you may know. We are adding server-side queries for time, client-side queries for time, and also client-side filtering uh, in, in 4.11. And then uh, we're gonna start working uh, right after Dev Summit on the rest of the time support. So time support in image tile, uh, image layers, like the tile layer, map image layer, imagery layer and then also on related widgets like the, the time slider widget. And now, yeah, Richie is gonna go over the, those new APIs. Uh, thanks, Jan. Um, as Jan said, at 4.11, we'll be adding basic support for time. Um, that includes um, time metadata. So this is an example of connecting to a feature service when the layer loads, you'll have access to a new property called time info, which includes some basic time information. And this is specifically for um, um, time-enabled feature layers. You'll, you'll get this information. So the information includes the start and end fields that are used for time, and also um, the time extent. This is the full temporal extent of the data. And so this information is used by the API, by, by you guys, but also by upcoming widgets we'll use this data. Um, also time extent, this is a, a property probably used to in uh, 3X. This describes a, bound, a, a date range. Um, it's used by time info. And more, more importantly, is it can be used in queries now. So we're gonna see a few examples of time enabled queries. Uh, so this is dealing with server-side queries. So let's say, for example, I want to look for large earthquakes for a certain time range from between the year 2000 and 2007. This is using the new time extent property of the query to only uh, request those, er those earthquakes. <laughs> so this is a server request. The request is going to server, and I get a response. In this case, how many earthquakes fit that criteria? time and um, attribute query. And again, uh, this, this assumes that the feature layer is time enabled. And if you're like me, you always forget to do that. So there is a cheat if you go to the developer desktop, develop, uh, des developer dashboard, you can actually retroactively time enable a layer. Um, you can actually use um, time-enabled queries on all the feature la layer queries. So you can return extents, counts you just saw, features, but also collect an array of object IDs that fit your criteria. So again, these are all server-based queries that are time-enabled. 
I have a demo of a client-side query, which, which I already had loaded. So here we're looking at over 10,000 earthquakes in a browser, and they've already been loaded up. And I'm going to apply a filter. So I'm only seeing earthquakes that are Yeah, so I see about 7,000 earthquakes here. These are all earthquakes that occurred after 1970. And as I move my cursor around, you'll see that earthquakes that are beyond, that were after 1970 and within a 500 kilometer radius are highlighted on the screen. So it's performing a spatial query and a time query on the fly using local data. So this is a client side selection. No, no trips to the server to do this work. And this is the code that actually performed that work. So the first part here is it's a, a regular query. It's using the query, create query method to automatically construct the query that includes um, the definition query and the time extent, so all, all earthquakes beyond 1970, and also the spatial selection, the spatial information. Okay, it's the first time I'll use the Mac here. Okay, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm asking my colleague to help me scroll my <laughs> screen here. Okay, so the, then the, the layer view is query, so it's important here, since it's client-based selection queries, you have to use the layer view, not the layer. So it's querying the data that's already loaded into the browser. So it returns, um, it returns the, the geometry of the search, the circle you saw on the screen. So we're adding that to the map. For all the features found, we're turning it into, a, we're highlighting them on the screen. And lastly, on the bottom of the screen, we're iterating through all the features and adding them to the, the chart. Yes, so Richie just showed a new feature also from, uh, from um, 4.11. It's called uh, return query geometry here. Uh, so if you specify uh, this to your query, uh, the server uh, um, with the, in this release, and, uh, but also the client side uh, queries, when you perform the, uh, the geometry query using a distance and a unit, uh, it will return uh, as, at the same time as the features that passes that query, it will also return you the, the geometry that was used to perform the selection. So in this case, it's gonna return a circle uh, centered on the, this geometry, this point um, of, uh, it's gonna be a buffer of 500 kilometers. Basically, so it's interesting because now you you will be able to use that geometry to give feedback uh, like directly on the screen. So as with the, the feature queries for the server base, those same queries are available to the layer view for client side queries, whether you're using time enabled or not. Those queries can be done client side now. Um, some tips, because we're, we're, we're relying on querying local data, we have to wait for their data to be downloaded, to be loaded into the browser. So in order to do that, we can watch or monitor the updating property of the layer view. This basically tells you when the data is finally downloaded. Um, you can also, um, if you're panning around, more data will also be downloaded so you can continue to watch this property. Another important consideration is that the geometry that's returned is generalized. So you have to take that into account when you're doing spatial selections and that uh, it may not have the result that you're looking for. Um, also, you're only basically querying the data that's within your visual extent. So uh, you have to keep that into account as well. You can't query information that's beyond your, your, your um, current visual extent. Now we're going to talk about some filtering. This is a fast way of dynamically 
um, filtering out information on the screen. So here we're looking at over 84,000 features. These are hurricane um, points. And just by, in real time, we're able to deselect or remove um, quakes from the screen. So this is done by using a new property on the layer view called filter. All we do is apply a query to the filter and that updates the display and filters out those um, events, those features that are, are not part of the, um, the query. So this is a slightly more advanced well, advanced example of using filters. These are using effects. So in this example, we can apply effects to features that are with, um, included in the query and also features that are excluded by the query. So for the ones which are excluded by the query, we're coloring the earthquake symbols as a semi-transparent or gray, um, gray symbol. So to do this, we're using the effects property on the layer view. We specify in the, 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 the query and the filter property, and then also specify what effects we want to be applied to those features that are included in the query and those which are excluded by the query. So in this case, we're using, we're desaturating and making earthquakes semi-transparent if they've been excluded by the query. And um, yep. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, lastly, uh, th these are all the different effects that you can experiment with, and these are some, some sample values that you can use to um, color your maps as you please. I think it's an interesting new feature because, uh, so the filtering, it's nice because it really like removes very quickly all the, the, the features from, from the screen, but then sometimes you just don't, you don't want to completely like remove them. You want to just, uh, de emphasize uh, the features you are not interested interested in or uh, emphasize uh, different ones so um, so yeah so in this case uh, like applying on the excluded effect uh, applying an opacity uh, to 25 percent will make like uh, certain certain earthquakes like uh, almost transparent uh, but you could also uh, uh, on the opposite side you could uh, select uh, the like Emphasize the other the, the other features, the ones that pass the uh, that filter uh, using the the included effect. Um, uh, on the on the supported effects, for now we only support uh, color uh, effects that uh, impact the color. But then uh, we we will uh, uh, probably add uh, some that will scale features and some that uh, rotate features, for example. Right, sorry. Cool. Yep. Now Jeremy is going to show how to use an uh, arcade and to visualize earthquakes by time, by age. <coughs> oh, sorry, put on number three. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, just zoom this a little bit, see it. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, we show earthquakes again. Uh, probably the most overused data set of all time, but it's constantly changing and it works great for time. Uh, so this is a uh, CSV uh, that uh, is from USGS. Um, they update it uh, every uh, periodically. I think every minute or something. You know me on. How long uh, they updated? No, I don't. They updated it a lot. Uh, and it's of uh, any earthquake that's been two and a half magnitude or greater uh, for the past week. And it's got the time string uh, in here and the location, along with other variables like magnitude and depth and so forth. Okay. Now, we've loaded that in as a CSV layer, um, and we're created a visualization where we're looking at the last two hours uh, would be in red, the last day in yellow, and the last week in gray, and then sizing it based on the magnitude. Uh, if 
we look at how we do this, uh, go to the code. This uses a CSV layer, it can also use the GeoJSON layer, which is coming out at 4.11. Uh, I've got the simple pop-up here, and now I've got this renderer. So the renderer is a unique value renderer. Now it's not targeting a field, but it's targeting a value expression. So let's look up at that uh, value expression. So this is my arcade expression um, that's gonna get executed <coughs> for uh, each feature. So the feature comes through, I can pull out its time, and I can use the date diff function between now uh, and that earthquake's time in hours. And then um, returning a string uh, when, uh, if it's less than two, I'm gonna call it hour. If it's, uh, sorry, greater than uh, two to 24, I'll call it the day, and then greater than 24, I'll call it the week. Um, and then if I go down to my legend here, um, I see I've got, um, if it's, these are the values that it's looking for, so that's what would be returned with the arcade string, hour, day, week, and then I've got a custom symbol for it. So if I go to the app, uh, reload it here, Uh, I see this one guy in red, happened at uh, 2.11. Um, or if I click on the, this one that happened at 11.37 today. Or this one down here, uh, a couple days ago uh, on 2.28. So this is an easy way to take, uh, you know, time information and then using Arcade to convert it into something else like relative time uh, under the hood. Uh, there's also a smart mapping module um, uh, for age, which will actually do the same thing. So you can use smart mapping uh, modules to create uh, an age style, which would be something like this. Um, but wanted to show how you would do it if you were uh, developing against it with Arcade. Jan? Yep. Um, yeah, and so now uh, I will show like what you can do today um, using visual variables to do some time visualizations. I uh, came up with this technique for uh, like a, a demo for the plenary like a couple years ago. Um, so this is the, the buildings of New York. Uh, let's, whoop, sorry. This is the building of, of New York and then I wanted to show when those uh, buildings were built. And so what, uh, what this app shows is like, as uh, I have this slider here, uh, well actually I can, can just play, and then um, you can see that uh, you have new buildings being built that flashes in blue, and then after uh, they turn um, kind of purple, fuchsia, and then they, they start to be like a, a more, uh, uh, more dark, um, uh, yeah, dark, dark color as they get older. And, uh, and also I have this indicator on the bottom right that uh, does a client-side query uh, to, to update statistics like the number of uh, buildings um, and the maximum height uh, and the average constru year of construction. So we're gonna go over uh, the different steps uh, kind of to reproduce this. Uh, this. This type of visualization is uh, it's gonna, we will apply that to the year uh, attribute that comes with every building, but then you could also uh, use that technique uh, with uh, any a numeric uh, field, basically. Okay, so, uh, so I styled it differently uh, just, to, just to be more clear on the screen. So here I have uh, all my uh, uh, buildings, and they are, uh, lots of them, as you can see, they are very tiny. I have a pop-up with uh, the attribute, and we can see that we have this, I don't know if it's clear on screen, uh, we have this, uh, this uh, construction year, 19, 1910, and so on. So to build this, uh, I have created this uh, feature layer using, uh, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a layer on the arcgis.com, so I just specify the ID, 
And then uh, the data has some, some of the field, some of the, the buildings there, uh, they don't have any, uh, the construction year is not set, so, or is set to zero. So what I do is uh, I filter all those uh, buildings that I, that I know is, the data is not good just by defining the, the, the definition expression. So like that, those buildings won't come back and I won't have any issues uh, visualizing them. And then also important when you have ton of data is to specify a mean scale because, uh, I mean, these are a lot of buildings and as you zoom out, uh, it's better to hide the, hide the layer. And, uh, and use like, for example, tile created from features uh, instead of uh, actual features. Uh, and then uh, I specify a very simple uh, renderer, a simple renderer using a simple field symbol with a, a dark uh, gray color. Now I have my map. I use uh, the uh, base map uh, called uh, Human Geography. Uh, it's a base map from the Living Atlas. It's a vector base map. So it's, it has this nice, he uh, uh, has those nice uh, vector, uh, like the labels and so on. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Very cool for visualizing uh, polygons. Uh, it exists in, uh, in, in, in light and dark. So then you have the map view and, and that's basically it for, for this one. Then, um, then the second step here was to add this, uh, slider at the bottom, yeah, it doesn't do anything, but just uh, add a, a, year of, uh, a year of visualization and then uh, uh, an HTML input range. So this is uh, that, that piece. Then we want to actually animate. So the idea uh, after is like, when I move my slider, I want to update uh, the, the renderer. Okay, so let's, let's see how it works here. Uh, as I move the slider, uh, you can see the, the buildings being built. And here I use the, I use the new uh, filter API. So let's go over this. I have this uh, set year function uh, where uh, this is the initial, uh, the initial year uh, I, I want to start my app with. And then uh, I declare an input handler uh, which will be called, it's a function that will be called every time I update my, um, my range here. And then I uh, subscribe to two, uh, to two events, the input, input handler, and the change handler. You can have to su su subscribe for the two, the, those two events because input is not handled in, uh, doesn't exist in IE11, so, you know, we have to deal with that. Uh, and uh, my set your function does uh, two things. Uh, first, it will update uh, the, um, it will, well, three things. It will update this, uh, uh, the indicator at the bottom left to see what is the current selected year and then uh, the slider value. And uh, every time I set the, I change the year, what I, I, I apply the filter like um, Richie showed you, uh, it's an attribute filter. So I, I specify that I'm interested into all the buildings uh, before or equal to the year that is displayed on the screen. Then after I can do anything. I could say I, want, I just want to show the uh, the buildings that are plus. Uh, well, actually, I could do that now. Uh, so let's say we change our uh, configuration now, and I want to see all the buildings that are built uh, five years before and uh, five years after. Um, so that are below and then uh, above or equal, right? So. Change that. Now it's going to be telling a different story. Oh. That's, uh, so pretty cool to see, uh, like to watch which building were, were built in, uh, in one decade, for example. All right, uh, let's move to the next one, next step. And so this is getting closer of the final result, right? So the idea is, uh, is, to, use, uh, is to use the visual variable uh, of the renderer. So I still have my set here and then my input handler here. And then the difference is that instead of applying a filter, I'm gonna apply a renderer. So, uh, and every time the year change, I create a new version of that renderer. 
So what you have to uh, realize here is that the JavaScript API, when you assign a new renderer to the feature layer, we try to be clever about like what's happening, what is the difference between the current renderer and the new renderer. If, uh, and that's, that's because uh, we are using WebGL, so when we have all those features in memory, we need to uh, organize them and uh, transform them into WebGL data structures, uh, vertex buffer and so on, and uh, to visualize uh, visual features, visualize features with, uh, by attributes, like uh, this year, uh, we, uh, we, we look at the renderer, and let's say the renderer here will tell me that uh, I want to visualize the construction year. Then uh, the WebGL code, he sees that field, and in, for each of the vertex, so for each of the position uh, um, of the triangles of those polygons, it will encode also that, that particular value. So let's say you change a renderer and then the renderer visualizes a completely different field, then we will need to completely refresh all the data because uh, we don't have the new field information in, in WebGL buffers. So, but in certain cases, for example, if you change uh, just the stops or the colors of, uh, of the visual variables, then we can go into we can go really fast. It can be like just a, uh, just a redrawing and then uh, all the, data, the WebGL data is good and then um, the GPU does all the work. And so the idea I came up with was to use uh, the year to calculate the different color stops. And so for all the, uh, the buildings of the current year, I would uh, draw them in fuchsia so that they, they can really pop. And then, well, I specify here a label for uh, the, 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 if I had a legend. And then, um, all the buildings that are five years old, I would still render them in fuchsia. But then, for the ones that are 20 years old or older than that, then they will be in gray. Also, what I, I so this is the uh, color visual variable, but then uh, I'm also setting some opacity on the exact same field. Uh, so all the buildings that are from the current year will be visible, we will have an opacity of one, and all the other ones that are before, like that are uh, built after uh, the, the, the year of visualization, they will, I will apply an opacity of zero. So like that on the screen, we will only always see visually the buildings that are uh, built. And so uh, every time we change, uh, we, we create a new renderer, we pass that current year, and then uh, the, like the new renderer uh, is created with the current year, and um, we assign it to the renderer, and now we detect that it's a, it's a fast pass, so now I can, like, really, it's like, it's, it's really much faster than the, um, uh, than the filter because all the work here is done by the GPU. So the GPU is just, uh, doesn't care about what you draw. Uh, it just, uh, it just uh, sees different colors and, uh, and uh, is happy with that. <clears throat> Whereas the filter before, it's a SQL uh, statement and all the work is happening on the CPU. So every time you change the filter, we need to go loop, uh, we need to scan all the features and, uh, and, and set their visibility flags. Uh, whether or not uh, their flags, whether or not they, they pass uh, the SQL expression. So that's, that's a nice effect. And finally, the final touch here will be uh, uh, to animate this. And so we'll be using a request animation frame to uh, uh, kind of loop uh, through the through the different years. All right, so let's go on this. <coughs> Create the renderer, blah, 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 same thing. And so now I declare a function called uh, start animation. Start animation will uh, be called whenever I, I click on the button. I stop the current animation, whether or not there, there is one and then I will start uh, the animation calling the animate function here. Stop animation, stop the current animation, nothing very interesting. And so animate, uh, pass the start value, which is the, uh, the current year, 
and then we declare our frame code. So the frame code, that frame function is going to be called um, every frame of the, of the web browser. So uh, if it's not animating, it stops, but uh, if we are currently animating, I'm just incrementing the current year by uh, 0.5, and then if I'm at the end of my data set, I'm uh, going back to the beginning of the data set. So like that, I uh, run Robin. And then uh, finally, I set the year, so which will update our renderer and uh, apply the effect. And then I have this uh, tiny code where I try to lock my browser at uh, 30 frames per second because like 60 frames sometimes is not really useful. So we do a set timeout. We divide a second by uh, 30 frames. And then uh, when the set timeout, uh, when the timeout uh, arrives, call request animation frame, which will, with the frame function, which will uh, loop again. And so I call the first time that frame, which will trigger the, the, um, um, the animation. <clears throat> and finally, I return an object with remove, and uh, it will just set the flag to false. So at the next frame, it will just uh, stop. So we can toggle like this. Uh, it's pretty nice. Um, before ending, I really I, I will I will stress out a little bit what uh, what's happening on the if we profile this. So we profile a little bit, and you will see that uh, most of the work is happening. Uh, there is like like we are at a good like 30 frames per second. Like I said, here we can see like there is no frames that that last, uh, you see like 29, 60 frame. We are way above like uh, our budget, so that's pretty, that's pretty good. If you are familiar with uh, DevTools, uh, uh, well, if you are not familiar with DevTools, this, uh, this is a frame, so uh, you have this budget, 16 milliseconds, to execute all the code that you need, and basically there is nothing happening. Whenever I, we update the renderer here, uh, like everything is fine. And nothing also is happening on the worker. So uh, we use multi-threadings. Uh, we have a worker framework in the API to offload uh, all the heavy work outside of, of the main thread. So like that, you know, when, uh, when you do uh, heavy, heavy, um, heavy queries or whatnot, uh, your uh, user experience is not impacted. If we go back to the filter before, I'll show you the difference. Where is it, this guy? Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna filter. And we will see that the, the CPU has, uh, it is doing much more work. Something strange that's gonna be fixed for 4.11 for here. It doesn't seem like it's trying to catch up. There is something wrong, but uh, we'll fix that uh, by, by the time we release. So we are still at a, a pretty, uh, pretty good frame rate, uh, you know. Well, 20 frames per second, I think we can do better, but, um, but here you can see that the worker, uh, the worker is doing a lot of work. And that's because uh, the query engine that executes those uh, client-side uh, filtering query and so on, it's all happening in, uh, uh, off, off, uh, off the main thread. You can see like we have this uh, function called set filter, which uh, will be called every time you set the filter on the layer view. <laughs> And it takes quite a, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of work just to set once the filter. It's uh, 60, 60 milliseconds, so it, it, it really like, um, you know, it, it's, if it was running in the main thread, it would really stutter. Uh, you would see uh, your animation not, not going really well. So anyway, this is, these are the different techniques that uh, you can use today and, uh, in, in filtering in, the, in 4.11. Um, do you have uh, anything to add? Do you want to talk about uh, future work? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think what we want to try to do for uh, yeah. So after the dev summit, we're going to start working on the on the time slider so that you can get uh, um, uh, nice uh, widgets, for example, to uh, to control your time information. Uh, we have also. Um, We'll try to, uh, we'll work on um, histogram charts like this to show the distribution of, uh, of features. 
So here by magnitude, but you can imagine the distribution over time so that you can easily like plug a little charts like this with a slider below. Uh, this is not the slider of the API, it's just something I built for the, for the presentation, but, um, but yeah, it would, it would show you the distribution like this of the data. And, um, and so as you, move, as you move the slider, you will be able to control whatever, uh, whatever you see on the screen. Rishi is gonna work on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we finish early, but uh, we'll have time for questions uh, if, uh, if you have some. Oop. And so that's a very good question. So the question is about the 3x temporal renderer. Um, will it be different from a 3x or something different? We don't know yet uh, the, the problem, and we are actively dis talking about this because um, the problem of the temporal renderer is like you, you, you can see all the observations uh, of your uh, temporal data, and you can see also the, the track, right? But the track, uh, like what, we're, the questions we are, uh, we, we are wondering about is, uh, uh, as a user, I want to be able, for example, to get statistics about that track. I want to get uh, the user to be able to click on the track. And what happens when he clicks on the track? Uh, can we have uh, maybe a pop-up template for that track? Um, so, um, so we are still like thinking about this. It's it's all gonna settle down uh, soon ish hopefully but uh, yeah that's yeah that's the, the idea like how can we get aggregated data uh, by time or binning or whatever and then and then like uh, uh, how can we specify um, like how it renders and uh, how uh, what happens when you click on it can you query can you highlight um, etc the other the other thing is that the 3x1 it just does this track line and um, actually we want, we think we, we think we can go beyond that and uh, start to create, uh, turning it into more of a like flow where you, each segment's uh, actually like a polygon that's, that has its own attributes that, from the previous observation to the next observation. Yeah. So you can visualize, uh, is it slowing down, is it getting narrower, or is it speeding up? Uh, and um, yeah, should I show this video? Hmm? Should I show that video? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Put it on number three. three? Um, is it three? Yeah, three. Yeah. Uh, let's let me run. This is a prototype that uh, Yaron had, had put together. Can you put it uh, full screen? Okay. I'm getting there. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, this is a albatross flying back and forth from Galapagos Island to uh, Peru. And um, I imagine there's a time slider here. And those are just observations, but they've been turned into these like track flow thicknesses. Uh, there's some issues here with like uh, tiles being cut off, so you know it's not perfect. But the, the idea is that we want to be able to uh, uh, generate these types of visualizations just based on observational data. We're also working with the uh, location tracking team, uh, so for track tracker and the track viewer, to try to work with them on uh, new ideas. Um, maybe we'll have things that they can put in. Maybe they've got some ideas we can put in. Um, I don't know. Here's one. Yes. Oh. Uh, the filter and FX uh, are coming in 4.11, so that will be released later this month. No. It'll just be like a couple weeks. Well, a little hint, it's already there, js.arcgis.com slash 411, but there's no documentation. So. To be honest, it's very hard because we have to prepare the dev summit and release after. And we tried once to, uh, to release before the dev summit, which would be ideal, but then it's like, it's a lot of work, and then after we have no time to prepare anything for right. dev summit. So. And Esri, uh, Esri messed with us. Dev summit used to be later in March, and then for the last, like, month, last couple of years, it's the beginning of March, and so it's impossible to have a release before. This guy over
Yeah, so the question is um, is about like, so yeah, in the visualization we showed uh, a point, one point in time, but uh, the, uh, will we be able to uh, show time slices of two hours, for example, and then just move two hours by two hours? Yeah, I think that the time slider will do, will handle those kind of, that slider will handle those kind of uh, time extent. And then after there are different, like depending how your data also is organized, there are different type of time queries you can make. Um, some features, they are like an earthquake, they are one point in time, uh, but then some feature, features, they have a life lifespan, so they have a start, uh, start, the start field and an end field, so you can make uh, features that are, uh, you know, in, yeah, different type of time data, and then the queries that, that you make, you can either like query for all the features that are, uh, before the, a certain time, or after a certain time, or in between time, uh, or that intersects the, the time. There is a, yeah, lots of documentation that will come with the, the new time, time queries uh, to explain all of this. Yeah. The, um, are Christian's demos on, on uh, uh, are available Which from the one? plenary? The, uh, oh, yes. Flood? Yes. Uh, do you, do you know what it is? No, sorry. It's, yes, uh, Ekenes. Yeah, oh, I will yeah, take another yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, can we visualize uh, the value changing over time? Uh, Right, so the way to model that is, uh, is to have multiple version, like you have multiple rows in your database <coughs> with the same polygon geometry, so there are two different features. So you will be, if you, like here for example, that New York data set is, uh, is nice, but it's only the, it only tells you when the current buildings of New York were built, uh, but if, uh, so, you know, like of course, like some buildings were destroyed, uh, and then some buildings were built on top of them, and we don't have that in that data. So, uh, but let's say if we add that, we could visualize the, the buildings uh, being built, the buildings being destroyed, and then rebuilt on, on top, of, and so on. But, yeah. yeah, so they are, if this is the case, it's two features in your database. It's like one feature where the height is, uh, you know, I don't know, like three stories, and then uh, one feature, one version of that, uh, of that building where it's five stories. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> time is, uh, is uh, interesting, and there's lots of ways to visualize it. Um, so this is these flood warnings that uh, uh, Christian demoed at the plenary, and uh, this winter, spring, summer, fall. Uh, now for this demo, I, I believe we calculated uh, uh, what season it was from the date uh, field itself, but that could have also been dynamic on the fly, filtering by that, uh, um, you know, that's basically just a date range. So that could have been client side. And then this, um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's still client side, it's just. Uh, just the query itself is not date related. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not time, uh, time information. And then the, this duration, uh, you know, that didn't exist in the data, but that's just the difference between the two uh, date fields. So um, uh, that's a very, uh, very powerful way to work with uh, data. So you have lots of options. Time is, uh, is very interesting uh, to work with from a visualization perspective. I think the one thing you, that's always difficult with time is uh, time zone. Uh, so you really need to know what the source of your data is and what time zone is it so that you apply things correctly. For this example, if we were to, instead of showing uh, uh, this range for, by uh, how long the flood warning was, if we were showing, did it occur in the morning or in the afternoon, night, that's different, to, you know, morning is different on the east coast than it is on the west coast, so it becomes more complicated dealing with time zones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
it's uh, yeah. We we <laughs> yeah, we still haven't solved uh, those questions. So the the question is like, if you have a lot of features, basically, how should I use? Should I try to filter them server side, or filter them client side? That's a is it the question? Sorry. Yes. It depends on the visualization you're trying to do. If you're trying to show that line segment over time, um, then it's better to, and you're gonna do it all client side, it's better to get all those features uh, down to the client and then control the visibility of those features based on what slice of time you're looking at. The other way to do it is you just have like okay, one feature and then you've got an attribute for each time value. That one uh, will have the hard refresh of the layer, so you won't be able to create a smooth animation mm. like Jan was talking about earlier because the GPU needs to be updated with this new attribute information. Uh, I don't know, I don't think Grayson's app, uh, that, that's basically what he was trying to mm. do. I mean, for the so for the time slider in 3x, every time the time slice change and uh, it moves, we re -re 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 we query again the server and then uh, we dispose the old data. But uh, we don't know yet like how we want to implement it in 4x because the client side filter is interesting because it's really f it's it's really fast and we don't have to go back and forth to the server. But then if you have like massive amount of data, then yeah, we we may want to. A filter server, a client, a server side. Mm. So in this case, yeah, maybe the the solution is a com combination of of both of them. But yeah. Mm. Definitely cool. Any yes. other questions? Cool. All right, uh, Jan, you have your filter section up. Yeah, Next. we have uh, a session at 5.30 and I will try to, uh, with Richie also, uh, it's at 5.30 and it's in right here, right? Here, right? <laughs> so uh, we'll go over again uh, filter and effects, uh, uh, but uh, uh, like different kind of demos. Cool, thank, thank you. you.